Nearly six months ago, I made a video telling you the Commander X-16 was nearly done and ready to produce, and we also launched a GoFundMe to help raise some money to put these into production. We raised almost $35,000 there, uh, and I also had a crowdfunding going on my website, which is actually still active today, and it has received over $16,000 there. Uh, put them together and you have over $51,000, which is uh, not only an amazing generosity from the community, but also showed what kind of interest there is in this project, uh, which really energized me and the entire team and community around the X-16. Well, in that video, I said we were going to attempt to build 50 units immediately, mostly to send to our various software and hardware developers. But uh, since we got all this money, we thought, uh, hey, let's build 100 instead. And so this is what parts to build 100 units looks like. Uh, there's a lot of tiny parts in here, more on the table. Over here is most of the ICs, and then uh, these are the various ports like the PS2, disk drive, and so forth. Oh, and uh, here are the PCBs, fresh from the factory. And uh, yes, these are made by PCBWay. Um, they actually made this entire first batch for us for free because they wanted to help out the X16 project too. So in a way, you could consider them to be one of our biggest donors. And these are 100 Vera daughter boards, and these are 100 development cards, which will also be included with the first 100. So uh, yeah, anyway, it's a massive amount of parts. So uh, then came the process of building these. Now, first, I'll show you the Vera boards, which contain actually more than just the Vera. They also have various video ports and the SD card slot on this daughter board. Now, currently, these are all assembled by hand, mostly surface mount parts. Uh, these take about 30 minutes to assemble, and then they go into an oven to melt the solder. And believe it or not, this is the easy part. Uh, the motherboard assembly is the hard part. I, I say hard, what I really mean is just time consuming. Uh, we're talking about six hours of labor to put one of these boards together. And then there's the keyboards. Uh, we actually have these fully manufactured keyboards like this one on the way from Perix, which should be here in a few weeks. But in the meantime, we've been buying these generic Parix keyboards on Amazon, and then a friend of mine has been making these label sheets for us, and uh, these actually have a thin layer of mylar on top of them, so they should hold up pretty well to usage, but they are very time consuming to install. Um, originally, it took me about an hour to do one of these keyboards, but uh, now I have it down to about 20 minutes. And uh, in fact, uh, the last few boards we sent out, I just threw the label sheet in the box for the end user to put on, but uh, anyway, as you can see, the keyboard looks almost identical to what the official factory produced version looks like. So by the time you include labor for the motherboard and the Vera and the keyboard and testing and packing and shipping, I mean, you're looking at like nine to 10 hours to produce a single Commander X-16. And so that combined with the fact that the price of everything has gone up over the last couple of years, means that uh, we're just not going to be able to hit that that price point that we wanted this model to be, which was going to be around $300. So one option that we've talked about a lot is offering kits. And I know that uh, a lot of people have asked for kits, but uh, kits come with their own set of nightmares as well. So for example, putting a kit together with this many parts is also extremely time consuming. But then there's the more uh, pressing problem, which is, you know, a lot of people are going to buy these kits, they're going to put them together, and you know, like, some of them are just not going to work. And those people are going to expect support, like troubleshooting support, which we're just not going to have time to offer. And so that's, that's not going to be a good thing either. So another option we looked at was having these assembled by a PCB manufacturer. And we looked at that ex extensively, and we determined that that came with its own list of logistical nightmares that uh, we also didn't want to deal with. But then we started thinking, it's like, well, what if we had the same equipment that the big PCB manufacturers had? Maybe we could manufacture these more efficiently ourselves. So we took all the remaining donation money, and that's exactly what we put it towards in hopes of being able to make these faster. So uh, we bought this device, which is called an axial lead bender, and uh, what it does is both cut and bend the leads on these components to exactly the size we need, and that saves a lot of time. Uh, Kevin also bought this pick-and-place machine. Now, uh, he bought this with his own money, it wasn't part of our fundraiser, but once he gets this thing properly configured, uh, it should help speed production of the Vera daughter board, as well as the hundred other products that he builds. But uh, here is the big one. This is the one we have really high hopes for that should cut our production times down dramatically. This is a solder dipping station, and uh, here's the solder for it. <laughs> 
So apparently if you're serious about soldering, you buy your solder in bars, which uh, by the way, uh, the solder alone in this sort of quantity was several thousand dollars. So the way this thing works in theory is that you fill this tub with solder, uh, you put your board on top and as you can see it will lower the board into the solder and back out which should solder all of the points on the bottom. Well, we also had to run 240 volts from the breaker box to power this thing, but uh, anyway, time to test it out. So uh, this is just an older Rev PCB Kevin and I had laying around, uh, we thought we'd use it for testing. So step one is to spray the bottom with flux, and then we'll set it on the bed of nails here. And here goes. You may notice the board warping like crazy. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, we didn't expect that. Uh, we're new to this process. Uh, although it did kind of work, uh, a good 90% of the joints did get soldered. So we kind of suspected the boards needed to be preheated, so we got this preheating plate, and uh, you can set it exactly what temperature you want. It takes a few minutes. Anyway, uh, here goes another test. Again, uh, this is with a scrap board. We haven't tried any of our good boards yet. As you can see, this board still flexes some, although not nearly as bad due to the preheat. Uh, the trouble is, it isn't getting all of the solder joints, and we think the problem may be we're using the wrong kind of flux. So anyway, we're still experimenting with this, but uh, we'll get it figured out eventually. But assuming we had all that figured out, here is another problem we're dealing with. The Yamaha YM2151 is the heart of our music system on the X16. We originally chose this chip for a number of reasons, not least of which is because it sounds awesome. reasons was, uh, despite this being an out of production chip, um, when we looked at the inventories available, several suppliers said that uh, they had 100,000 units available or, or, or something to that effect. And so we thought, well, there's plenty of stock available. Unfortunately, when we actually got ready to start production and we went and say, hey, yeah, we want to buy a thousand of these, uh, then some of those uh, suppliers came back and says, hmm, well, um, actually, we don't have a thousand of these. And so they canceled our orders. The likely reason for this is that many of these suppliers are sort of interconnected. If one supplier's computer says, I have 100,000 of these in stock, then basically they all say they have 100,000 in stock because uh, they all have deals with each other and if you buy from this guy, uh, he'll be able to get the parts from the guy over here. Unfortunately, it turned out that uh, one supplier thought they had a bunch and actually didn't. Other suppliers have sent us the chips we bought, but uh, they turned out to be fake. Yep. Every one of these is a fake chip. This has been a problem plaguing the retro community for a while. So while this looks like a legitimate Yamaha chip, uh, when we put this in the board it causes a dead short and the computer won't even power on. Somebody has resurfaced the top of these and silk screened the Yamaha part number on there. Now who knows what kind of chip it was originally. Um, I tried using some acetone on some of these but uh, all I managed to do was rub off the silk screen. I couldn't find any numbers hidden underneath. But there is little question these are fakes. I mean, here's a real Yamaha chip that works, and here's the fake next to it. Now, one big clue that these are fakes is that every single one of these fakes looks absolutely identical on the top, even having the same date code. But when you turn them over, you'll see every one of them looks different on the bottom. Some will even have markings and stuff. There's a few suppliers we found that have legitimate chips, but they're now charging $11 a piece. Uh, and when we started this project, we assumed we'd be paying $2 a piece for these. So um, we've been working on a plan B and plan C for the Yamaha chip situation over the last few months. So this is our plan B. Joe Burks has created an FPGA replacement, which is a small daughter board that can take the place of the Yamaha chip and its companion digital to analog converter. Uh, this solution works, but it still isn't cheap. It's also around $11 to build one of these, and that's just the parts, uh, not taking labor into account. Uh, but the important thing is it does work. Um, we've also been working on a plan C in case plan B didn't work out. As you can see, uh, this is an expansion card that has two Yamaha YMF262, otherwise known as the OPL3 chip used in sound cards such as the Sound Blaster 16. Now, these are also out of production, but I think these are considerably more available than the chip we're using. Uh, we started with an expansion card just to, so we could test the chip for compatibility, and Kevin did write a small program that plays a VGM file, and it seems to work. So the problem with Plan C is, so imagine we took these uh, OPL3 chips and we substituted them uh, directly on the board in place of the YM2151. Well, okay, that's great. The board now has a sound chip, but... Um, 
it's now no longer compatible with the um, you know hundred or so pieces of software that have already been written for the Commander X16. So that would be a last ditch resort uh, if if we simply couldn't come up with any other alternative. And the problem with the OPL3 is they're not in production anymore either. And while there is probably a larger supply of those available, they will also eventually run out. And even though we probably won't be using it for the main system sound chip, uh, Kevin will continue to produce these expansion cards with the OPL3s on them because, uh, you know, a lot of musicians have been uh, playing around with the X16 because it already has uh, so many options for chip tunes. And so this will just be one more option available to musicians. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is the case. Now, this case is actually being manufactured by Laser 3D. And what you're about to see here is just a prototype. Uh, there will be a number of changes to the final case. Um, I should also mention that the case is optional. So for those that don't like it, you don't have to buy it. <laughs> so the board will mount in here like so. And uh, remember, this is a standard ATX board, so you can mount it in whatever you want. Um, the case comes with two different tops. As you can see, this is the clear top, which I'll probably use when showing off the computer at conventions and stuff. And then uh, you can also use the opaque white top like this. Uh, I very much like the look of this. So uh, obviously this case is kind of low profile, so you could probably put one card in here sideways on a 90 degree riser. In fact, I've asked the designer if he could lower this case slightly more and add a cartridge port over here on the corner for the last slot. Now, future versions of the board will use a 90 degree card edge connector so that the cartridges can be inserted from the side of the case. Okay, so let's talk about cartridges. So you may be asking, like, why would we need a cartridge when our system has an SD card and you can put whatever you want on there? Well, um, the cartridge can hold three and a half megabytes of ROM, and that ROM is directly accessible by the CPU. So if your game needs to have um, a lot more uh, graphics or sound effects that are uh, immediately accessible to the CPU, this is the way to do it. Uh, there's other things that the cartridge can offer as well. Um, you know, we have the option for non-volatile memory where you can store things on there. And uh, also, uh, you could, if you wanted, put like helper chips on there, just like was done with uh, other game consoles in the past. So if you needed a 3D vector generator or something like that, you could put it in a cartridge in theory if, if you wanted to do something like that. So cartridges do offer some benefits that the SD card uh, can't match at this point. So this was our first cartridge we used for development. It actually has two 512K chips on it, but room for up to 3.5 megabytes. Uh, this last chip is actually a 512K RAM chip. So uh, yes, we can put ROM or RAM on the card. And um, the little battery over here will keep the RAM alive even when the system is powered off or the cartridge is removed. Also, there's a little slot down here for a serial flash RAM chip that can hold 64K. Uh, this could be used for save games or high scores or whatever. So just to show you how this works, um, I'll remove the SD card from the computer, and then uh, this card can go in any of the four slots. And upon power on, you will see it starts the game automatically. Of course, this board was uh, only designed for game development, so uh, we need something smaller for the final product. So we've condensed this down to a smaller surface mount version that does exactly the same thing. Now here I have uh, six flash chips and a space for one more. And uh, we've added the option to have up to four of these 64K serial flash chips. So that's 256K there. And of course the idea is you would only populate whatever parts your particular game or software needs. Uh, so this one for example is Zixit and uh, it only needs the two flash chips. And uh, this card is designed to fit in a standard Famicom shell since uh, those are readily available. And so uh, there you have Zixit as a cartridge. And uh, I'll just stick this in the computer so you can see how that works. And if you're thinking the cartridges don't fit very elegantly into the system, hold that thought. <laughs> I'll explain uh, in a bit where this is going. So let's have a look at some new software that ha has been designed since last time. Uh, first of all, we now have the ability to flash the firmware on both the system ROM and the Vera FPGA from the system by simply running a program from the SD card. Uh, this means uh, even if you buy an X16 today, uh, you'll be able to take advantage of future updates by simply downloading a firmware update and putting it on an SD card. Now one new game we have is Marble Madness. Now this was ported uh, from the Nintendo version by Mooing Lemur, the same guy that did our Super Mario port. But uh, unfortunately, much like Super Mario, we don't have the rights to distribute this, so you won't be getting a copy with your X16. 
But uh, we have another NES ported game, also done by the same guy, but this time we do have permission. Rob Jager, the original designer of Montezuma's Revenge, gave us permission to port and distribute this with the X16. Here we also have a Frogger clone. It's not finished yet, but it is somewhat playable. Likewise, uh, here's another work in progress called Quack, which is uh, similar to Dr. Mario. This is a new video poker game, which actually runs in high res mode. And don't forget Zixit, which I ported myself from MS-DOS, and I did a whole video about it uh, a while back. And last but not least, I'm working on a sequel to Planet X3, which I'm calling Planet X16. <laughs> it's a real-time strategy, but uh, this time it will be fully mouse-controlled, and that's because uh, every X16 will include a mouse, so we might as well support it with software that can make use of it. Um, this will make the uh, user interface far more familiar to those that play real-time strategy games. I'm a long way from being finished with this, though. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about future plans. So right now we're focused completely on trying to get the manufacturing issues sorted out with this current board so we can start shipping those to as many people as, as want them. But once we get that sorted out, we're going to turn our attention to developing the game console version or the second generation version. This is just a little concept I put together to show what it might look like. So uh, it would have a cartridge port right on top with the uh, various ports around the edges. And this is by no means an official product. It may change dramatically by the time production comes around. This is just to give you an idea of what we're thinking. And uh, let's talk about size. So as you can see, the current system is similar in size, if not smaller than an original Nintendo. And by comparison, we'd expect the X16 game console to be more like this in size. Uh, likewise, uh, we expect it to be half the price. Okay, so the second half of this video, um, I've got Kevin Williams here with me, and we're going to give you a few more updates, and then we're just going to go through a list of some of the more common questions that people are always asking about the X16 and see if we can answer them adequately. Uh, first, I'm going to let Kevin show you. Uh, he's made a little progress on solving the board warping. <laughs> yeah. Well, we certainly had a problem with the board constantly warping it, no matter what variation of temperatures and flux we tried. And I finally talked to someone, uh, one of the manufacturers of Flux, and they suggested that I build a brace for it. And I'm guessing this isn't exactly what she had in mind, but I did actually come up with something that does prevent the board from flexing. And despite how heavy it looks, uh, the solder is very dense and this will float on top. And it's actually finally starting to uh, get really close to the results that we're looking for. So I'm confident that uh, we'll get there. It's just a matter of a little bit more trial and error to work out the production process. But uh, this is kind of the answer that I've come up with at the time being, for the time being. So. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the most common questions that people ask is they want to know, when are they going to be able to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you know, we were hoping that was going to be six months ago. Uh, reality kind of set in, as we've kind of shown in the video, some of the problems that we're having uh, producing this thing. But, uh, you know, um, we're, what would you say, like right on the cusp of, of being able to... Yes, very close. I mean, we're working out the, the final steps here. It's certainly towards the end of this process, certainly not the beginning. So I think within a few weeks, I should be able to get these into a reasonable amount of production. And the solder time that was taken six hours by hand, I'm hoping this will take 20, 30 minutes uh, by the time we get it down. And that will certainly uh, reduce the cost and, and make it as easy as possible to get these out the door. <laughs> so next next part of that question would be not only when can they buy one but where will they be able to buy one and that's still a little up in the air but we're going to go ahead and say at least for the first um, production boards you're going to have to go to TechSelect. Uh, Kevin will be selling those from his website so you're not going to be able to buy those on the 8-bit guy. Um, but, uh, and we don't have any information about it at this moment but within a month once we get to the point where we're able to start producing these we should have them out there. Um, I know a lot of people have asked about pre-orders, and at this moment we don't really have any plans for that. Um, we haven't really found out a fair way to distribute the machine, so I think that when they go live, I'll probably make a tweet, and <laughs> that'll be it. So keep your eyes open, but it'll probably be, I would say, a month from now. Yeah, so moving on, the next question that's most common that people want to know is how much is it going to cost and believe me i've wanted to be able to throw a number on this for years now and it's just been so difficult to figure out 
Like I didn't want to give someone a price and then us come back later and it not be not be the right price, right? So we've been kind of holding off until we actually knew what we we're going to sell them for. So I think what we've decided is this first run of boards, the first hundred. Uh, actually, it's not even a hundred because we're going to be still we still owe like twenty. Yeah. 82 I think yeah we still owe like 20 people uh, boards um, so yeah we'll be able to sell like as he said like 80 something of of these boards and um, of this first production run we're actually looking at uh, $500 and I know that's way higher than what I wanted it to be and we are planning on being able to reduce that uh, for the next run of boards but we've just got so much cost sunk into this and, uh, um, but I will tell you, um, the first run of boards are going to be, how should we put this? Uh, <laughs> decked out. Yeah. 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 So, um, let me, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to get for your 500 bucks. So you are going to get obviously the board with the full Ram expansion on it. Um, you're also going to get a mouse and a keyboard and a power supply and a dev, uh, cartridge. Uh, well, not a cartridge. Well, a it's card. Just an expansion. Board. Yeah, an expansion card. We we showed these earlier. It's just like got a whole bunch of holes. It's in a prototyping it. board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For you stick it in the expansion slot, and you can prototype uh, prototype things in there. So, so you're gonna get a lot of stuff uh, for the uh, for the first board. Um, we're hoping to knock a hundred, maybe 150 bucks off the next run of boards. Um, and then, of course, obviously, when we get into the Gen 2, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, then those will be even cheaper. But uh, but that's where we're at right now with the first 82 boards or so. Okay, so there's another concern that keeps coming up a lot every time I talk about the Gen 2 system or what we're going to pretty much from this point forward call the game console, which is, of course, people are angry because they're like, well, I'm going to be losing this feature and that feature and that feature and so forth. And I think the big takeaway here is to reassure everyone that just after, I mean, just because we come out with the game console version does not mean that the current ATX version is going away. It's it's not. We're, we're going to continue to offer that, uh, you know, alongside the Gen 2. So if you don't like the Gen 2, no problem. Don't buy it. <laughs> buy the Gen 1. Uh, you know, in fact, Kevin here will talk a little bit about um, what you might want a Gen 1 for. Right, and the Generation 1 board was really meant to be the power user board and have all of the bells and whistles available. And as we move forward to the second version, like multiple expansion slots, the optional user port, things like that will probably be removed from the system for not only cost reduction, but just for really keeping the game system focused on being a game system. And that's why the Generation 1 board will always be available for those who actually want to use the system in a more expandable way or for other applications that may not be suitable for 512K and you need a little more RAM, and there you go. Yeah, in fact, we've uh, we've been talking a little bit about the nomenclature of these boards and, uh, you know, calling them Gen 1, Gen 2, or whatever. And I think we've actually decided that the current board that we're producing now is going to henceforth be called the developer board or the dev board because even though it's no longer going to be used for the development of the uh, architecture, it's going to be used for development of games or other hardware. And so uh, if you're a developer, you're going to want the dev board. And if you're just interested in, um, you know, other things than the game console version, which, you know, I say game console, it's still going to have a mouse and a keyboard and you're still going to be able to run basic on it. And you're still going to be able to, you know, do all those, all those things on it. Uh, but, you know, it's not going to have the full memory. So, uh, you know, for example, we're planning on having compilers that run in the upper memory and then you could compile to the lower memory and uh, you won't be able to do that on the, the game console version. But so, uh, you know, and of course, if you need the expansion slots, yeah, you'll want to use the, the dev board. So, yeah, it will, you know, rest assured it's not going away. <laughs> OK, so a little bit about the game console version that we're planning to develop. And uh, you, all, people are already asking the question of. We're using a Famicom shell. Will it play Famicom games? What a yes. <laughs> well, no. And, and as it turns out, um, we went through a number of iterations on what the expansion port should look like. And initially, I was going to use a 50-pin connector, but I was afraid that people would confuse it with the Apple II port, which, just to be clear, it's not compatible with anything except the Commander X-16. <laughs> it's a proprietary port designed for use on this system, and there is no other cartridge. Even if you can physically plug it in there, 
that is meant to work in this system. That being said, I inadvertently picked the Famicom <laughs> as the, uh, the pinout that I used. I didn't realize it at the time. But as it turns out, it's a little bit fortunate because now we're able to buy off-the-shelf shells and use them yeah. uh, directly for our cartridges, which is great because we don't have to develop a shell now. So while it may seem confusing for some, please know this is not a Famicom. <laughs> it is not meant to play Famicom games. And uh, it will probably destroy your Famicom cartridge if you plug it in, just to be aware. So don't try this at home. <laughs> So, uh, moving on, talking about cartridges themselves, uh, one thing we didn't touch on a lot in the first half of the video is some of the other functions that these cartridges are going to um, be used for. So, I, I did talk about some of the advantages the cartridge had in terms of uh, technology, you know, with the extra, you know, ROM space, being able to do more graphics and sound and stuff like that. But um, there's another thing we haven't really talked about publicly yet, which is... Um, there's, I'm not going to say them by name yet. We're really not ready to uh, announce this yet. But there's there's a, a company out there uh, uh, that's um, well known in the uh, software industry. They're a big player in the software industry. And they're actually very interested in the Commander X16 um, to be used for competitive gaming. So the, the idea was with the cartridge is that you would have like a TPM module in the cartridge. It would have like an encrypted serial number that's unique to that cartridge. And likewise, there'll be something similar in the actual machine. And you would be playing uh, speedrun type games, uh, games in, or games that you would compete for either the fastest time to completion or like a high score, right. those kind of things. So, you know, we're not talking about Fortnite here. We're not, you know, so these would be like more 80s style games. Uh, you know, imagine like Donkey Kong, Super Mario Brothers, that kind of thing. Now, they, they'd probably be new games uh, designed just for the system uh, with the idea being that, you would go and you would compete. Uh, there will be a network interface, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, then you would you would compete, and there would be bounties, things you could win if you, you know, were the had the high score or the fastest run time. Leaderboards, high yeah. scores, uh, yeah, times, yeah. everything uh, yeah. collected automatically from <laughs> things like system. that. So that's that's kind of where we're going with the game console system. And uh, like I said, once we get there, we're going to have some. Uh, synergy with this other uh you know large company and hopefully they're going to help a little bit with the funding investment of getting the gen 2 brought to market but uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there we'll talk a little bit more about that later but just to give you an idea of kind of what the long-term plan is for that so moving along let's talk about the networking situation we actually don't have a functional network card at the moment um thomas cherry Ohms is currently working on um a FujiNet implementation, although I don't know if that's going to wind up being the de facto standard network on the X16 or not. Um, no, that was sort of the point of the development run was to work problems like this yeah, out, and we're yeah. definitely having some issues there, but uh, yeah, uh, still we're still evaluating that piece. We're still trying to figure out how to get that to work, so we may end up developing our own network card, but uh, one way or another, we're going to eventually have a network card, and the Gen 2 system or the game console will have that built in. As it won't need a card. It will just be part on the motherboard. And the idea is we're looking to have um, online communities for where you can actually sit down at your X16 and you would actually be able to log into, you know, kind of like bulletin boards, you know, almost like 80 style bulletin boards, although they'll probably be considerably more complex because the back end of this will probably be running on like a, you know, Linux machine or something, not on a Commodore 64. <laughs> and, you know, so there'll be like multi-user chat rooms and uh, forums and things that you can access through like a terminal interface. And then hopefully we're, you know, would work at some point on some kind of GUI interface. I hesitate to use the word web browser. Yeah. But something kind of like that I could see in the future where it was a GUI network interface where you could, uh, there would be very specific Commander X16 related things that you could do online, including downloading new games. Um, and of course, you would need this um, for our, our competitive gaming system as right. well, because you would need to be able to transmit uh, encrypted data um, for for your gameplay so that uh, it could be validated and know that it was not fake. <laughs> and, and I think it's important to note too that this is optional. This won't be a requirement. So sure. if you want to protect your privacy and just play alone at home, that'll certainly yep. still be available to you as well. Right. In fact, we're thinking a lot of these games will be available to just download and play on the SD card. But if you want to play them competitively, then you would need the cartridge. 
And that's the, that's kind of the way we're looking at that too. So if you're not interested in the competitive gaming, you could always just play these games right off the SD card at home, you know, without any kind of uh, network connectivity. So that's uh, kind of the way we're looking at that. So another thing that I'm really hoping to have in the future is better development tools on the actual system. And we mentioned that briefly earlier. So I want to be able to people to sit down at the Commander X16 and and write their programs, whether it be in assembly, basic, you know, C, Pascal, whatever, and actually have e editors and compilers that run on the system. And I think we have enough RAM that we could compile pretty quickly. I know it was a pain to compile on like a C64. And the reason for that was because it had to read everything from disk and have multiple passes yes. because it just didn't have enough RAM uh, for the compilers to do all the work in RAM. But I think we have enough RAM here that that won't be a problem. And so I think that we'll be able to program right on the machines. And uh, one of the things that I really want us to have is an enhanced basic editor. I mean, sure, right now you can code basic just like in the olden days by typing line numbers and, and, and writing out your code and listing it and so forth. But, uh, you know, you, once a program gets to a certain size, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to manage. And so what we're hoping to do is have like a full text editor style basic entry where it eliminates the line numbers and you can use like labels for, you know, uh, you know, go to, uh, you know, like regular words that make sense, but also for variables as well. Um, and then when you're ready to run it, you know, you push like F1 and it would just um, transcode that over to uh, basic tokens, you know, tokenize it and then throw it into lower RAM and then run the program. And your basic, the actual text of it would be stored in the higher RAM so that it wouldn't interfere with each other. And so I think that would be a much, much more convenient way to write basic code. And then the cool part is I eventually hope to also have like, okay, F1 is to transcode or tokenize to basic. Then F2 would take your program and blitz it or compile it to like P code basically. So and if you think about that, like um, blitz on the C64 made programs run maybe eight times faster than basic on average. So our computer is already eight times faster than a C64. And if you had blitzed code, uh, that's another eight times. So that's like, that means you could write basic code and have it run 64 times faster than what it would run on a C64, which means basic would be a considerably more usable language on the X16 if we, uh, if we get all that working. And another thing that I've been focused on since the beginning is the audio side of the system. And it's very clear now that we've got pretty much every bit of the hardware we need to make just about anything that happened in the 80s. And with that in mind, it really seems like a good platform for chip tune music, uh, you know, FM type of music that people are in decomposing these days. And as, as a result of that, I really think that the dev board would also be useful for audio development down the road. Uh, with the top one and a half megs of RAM, we should have enough to add samples. Uh, certainly add on sound cards because we can inject audio from the expansion port. So you literally could add as many chips as you can envision. Um, sequencers and other pieces of software could be developed down the road that would actually make use of all of this stuff and make it a pretty compelling platform for making music uh, on an 8-bit system. Yeah. So certainly something that uh, I hope to see developed down the road. Okay, now we're just going to answer some of the questions that people always ask about hardware decisions that were made on the X16. And uh, we'll start with, um, you know, one of the questions that people ask a lot is, why not use HDMI? And actually, the answer to that is more complicated because we can use HDMI. <laughs> In fact, uh, I've actually shown this working before, just using one of those little, like, $12 adapters that you get on Amazon uh, that can convert VGA to HDMI. And they work perfectly fine. Um, the Probably the uh, most annoying part of using one of those is that you do have to have an external power supply. Um, but yeah, you can take an X16 as it is right now uh, with like a $12 adapter from Amazon and bam, you got HDMI. But um, the reason we didn't support HDMI is actually not just one, it's like a laundry list of reasons um, why we originally didn't support it. However, rather than go into all that, um, I will say that um, one of our guys, Joe Burks, is actually working on a new Vera module that uh, actually replaces the VGA output with, it's not really HDMI because I don't think it's licensed by like the HDMI, whatever the federation or whatever it is. So uh, yeah, it's let's just say it's a com signal that's compatible <laughs> with HDMI. <laughs> 
So in the future, you'll be able to order your X16 and you'll be able to pick, like, do you want the traditional Vera board with the VGA output uh, or do you want a board with HDMI? And you'll be able to pick whichever Vera board you want and, and there you'll have it. Uh, personally, I mean, the VGA one is probably the most versatile because uh, you can run a VGA or HDMI on it. I have a feeling if you went with the HDMI version, you probably could not run a VGA. There are cables, but uh, they have conversion issues going yeah. both ways, really. And, of course, both units will still have composite and S-Video. Uh, so yeah. what, even if you have the HDMI, you'll still have the composite option. So moving along, why did we use the Super Nintendo controller? I get asked that a lot. A lot of people were really adamant that we use either a Commodore Atari style nine pin connector or, um, or, or something else. And uh, that like Genesis controllers, stuff like that. The Super Nintendo controller is really ideal for a number of reasons. And let's just list them out here. Um, first of all, they're readily available. You can still buy them brand new on Amazon for like, five bucks or whatever so uh so that's 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 one thing uh number two is they're a really simple design to interface with it's just a regular shift register you only really need three io lines uh to control or to you know to read from a super nintendo controller and um, you can share two of those amongst multiple yeah. controllers so yeah yeah, so the, the, the number of I.O. lines you need uh, is dramatically lower than using the uh, traditional Atari-style controllers. And, of course, you've got more buttons. you got basically 12 buttons, depending on how you look at it, with the Super Nintendo controller. Um, and, you know, one of the things I learned a few years ago when I started doing Planet X2 and some of those games on the Commodore 64 is I'm like, how do you make these complex games work on a regular Commodore joystick? And the bottom answer, or bottom line is, you can't. <laughs> And I think that the one button limitation of those systems, um, you know, in retrospect, I think really limited both the Commodore and the Amiga, um, you know, compared to games on, you know, Sega and Nintendo platforms and stuff that had more buttons. And I did not want to be limited by the one button joystick. So, and of course, a lot of people will say, well, gee, David, why not use the, the Genesis controller? Because it has that same nine pin connector that a Commodore would have. And that's exactly the reason I wouldn't want to use a Genesis controller. Not only are they more complicated to interface with, but um, you know that if we had the 9-pin D-sub there, people are going to be cramming, you know, Atari yeah. joysticks and stuff in there, and they're not going to work. And nothing else fits the Super Nintendo controller port except a Super Nintendo controller. So, <laughs> that's right. so I think that uh, by going with that, it solves like a laundry list of problems, and it was just it just seemed like the most logical choice. And, uh, and that brings us to another thing I want to say, you know, and this is going to apply to a lot of these things on the list. Uh, for example, I get questions to this day emailed to me saying, hey, David, why don't you put uh, a Z80 in the X16 instead of a 6502? And the thing I want to say about that is, first and foremost, the design is done. Right. I mean, asking questions like why put a Z80 in there is kind of ludicrous at this point because you're basically asking me to redesign the entire computer from scratch, even though we've been working on it for four years now, <laughs> just to put your Z80 in there. So, no, um, I, you know, I, I, we're not going to change anything like that. The, you know, it's, it's far too late. Like the design is set in stone. Please don't bother asking me anymore about changing architecture and stuff like that on the x16 it's we're way beyond that um and on that note the 65 or the 65 c 816 was originally one of the processors we had planned to use yeah but as we move forward in the design very early on uh the decision was made to stick with the 65 co2 our memory architecture everything that we've designed is, is really based on that now having said that you actually can drop a 65 c 816 into the system it won't work with our kernel. However, uh, if you did want to try that down the road, you still could uh, develop your own kernel and uh, make use with it however you like. But uh, just keep in mind that the Commander X16 name kind of stuck, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, as a result of it being originally an 816 based machine. But uh, we didn't really want to change it after the fact. So that's kind of why the name stayed the way it is. But it is still planning or planning to be a 65 CO2 machine. And if you did put an 816 in there, um, 
you, you'd have all the 16-bit instructions, but you wouldn't have the memory model of an 816. Right. You'd still be limited to the memory model that we have now. So probably not a huge advantage. Not really. <laughs> And even with like the Z80 that people ask about a lot, I mean, even if it were as simple as just dropping in a Z80, I mean, we'd have to redesign the operating system from scratch. And, you know, we wanted to be able to run the Commodore operating system. That was one of the original goals of the system. And we can't do that with a Z80. So that's another reason why. Well, it's also fair to mention that enough pins are exposed on the expansion port from the processor that you should be able to add any other processor you like. Uh, and have it completely take over the system, work with this onboard processor. So there are plenty of options available if that's something you want to work on down the road. So we could theoretically make it like a Commodore 128 and that it would have a Z80. You could make it boot CPM theoretically. It totally could do it. Uh, so just something to keep in mind if you're looking for that down the road. We'll have the schematic out there. <laughs> so um, one of the other questions is uh, what happened to the $50 computer? Because that was one of the original goals, and it still is. Um, obviously, we're at 10 times that cost right now, but we always knew the first generation was going to be more expensive, and I don't think we ever said otherwise. It's um, like the first Tesla. Yeah. It wasn't the cheap one. <laughs> right. right. So, you know, we still do have a goal. I mean, I've already stated the next run of the dev board is already going to be cheaper. We're hoping that will be around 350 bucks. Um, and then we're hoping the game console version will be half that, maybe around 150 bucks, something like that. And then we still have hopes for a fully, you know, condensed like FPGA or ASIC version um, of the board that would be like a Raspberry Pi for 50 bucks that might be available in a few years if we get that far. <laughs> you know, so uh, that is still the goal. It always has been. Uh, we're just not there yet. And the last question we have on our list is, will it play Doom? <laughs> well, not at the moment. Not at <laughs> least in a form that anyone would think is Doom. But uh, there's definitely some promising development coming, and I think it's very feasible that someone will be able to come up with a method to make something very much like Doom, if not make a very low-resolution port of it, uh, yeah. like some of the other systems. I think at absolute minimum, I mean, we already have kind of a proof of concept Wolfenstein thing that runs that uses textured, uh, you know, walls and stuff like that. And I mean, so that shows we've got the CPU power to do a game like that. Um, personally, I don't understand the math or I would probably write it myself. But uh, <laughs> so I need someone smarter than me to come in and, and write the uh, write a game like that. Um, but I definitely think we have the CPU power to pull off some kind of 3D first-person shooter, whether that be just using uh, simple filled polygons instead of textured polygons or just a Wolfenstein type, uh, you know, a Blake Stone type game or something like that. I think uh, definitely think that it's possible. I mean, obviously, you're never going to see... You know what's what's that? You know, Crisis or yeah. Unreal or, or or you know Fortnite or, or you know any of that kind of thing. But uh, I definitely think we can have some kind of first-person shooter at some point or another. <laughs> and like many game systems, we're still in the very very early days, and there's already been some very impressive software coming out. So it's as time progresses and people figure out a little bit more what they can do with the Vera and with the hardware. I really think we're going to see some impressive stuff coming. I would bet most of the games now are not even hardly taxing the CPU. Yeah, they're not. Like, yeah. yeah. And so that's it. Um, obviously, you got any questions, post them in the comments or get on one of the uh, forums. We've got a, a very active Facebook group, a very active Discord group. Um, obviously, there's forums on the commanderx16.com website. So if you've got questions there, um, you'll, you'll find answers from the community. So... Uh, Anyway, I guess that wraps it up. Thank you.